Hi, I'm Michaela Angela Davis, and get ready for Mad Free, where we have liberating conversations with revolutionary women. And this is our exclusive Happy Hair Edition. And I'm so excited that we're doing this in association with Brooklyn Independent Media, a new channel by, for, and about Brooklyn. Hi, welcome back to Mad Free, and I'm so happy that we're having our happy hair conversation. This, this conversation in particular is 13 years in the making. This book I've been holding for a while. So first things first, sign my book while I do your intro, all right? <laughs> um, my guests today are uh, Ayana Bird and Lori Tharps, and they are the um, authors of Hair Story. And why I said this is 13 years in the making, this is not the first time this book has come out, right? Nope. Nope. So let me just, so that we have a new one um, that's updated and revised. But I just want to know how this started, why it took 13 years for me to get uh, uh, an autograph. No, but really, <laughs> when did you start working on this idea of telling this story about our hair, and your your um, title is Untangling the Roots of Black Hair in America. How did this start? It started actually over 20 years ago. Lori and I we were both in, I was in undergrad at Barnard, and when Lori was getting her master's at Columbia Journalism, we were both separately, before we knew each other, working on projects about, mine was specifically black women and hair, it's more sociology. Why is our hair so important to us? What does it mean beyond just, this is how I style my hair? Like, I knew it meant more just because I knew how I felt, and I wanted to document it and talk to other women. Lori was across the street at Columbia looking at the history of black hair and uh -huh. the business side. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was, um, for our master's thesis, we had to choose a topic that we were going to cover for the entire year as a long-form journalism piece. Uh -huh. And we could choose any topic. And I just knew I obviously wanted to do something that meant something to me personally. Uh -huh. And for some reason, I can't even like recall what was that nugget that uh -huh. made me say, this is what I'm going to do. But once I decided that I wanted to figure out why hair was so important in American culture, but also why we were living in kind of a separate society where there was the black hair society and mm -hmm. the non-black hair, like why were these so separate and, and so this significant? Was 20 years ago. Yes. So you were really ahead of the curve. I mean, I've always said that black hair is a religion, right? Mm -hmm. And we've all had a very specific um, relationship with our hair, and it's one of the things that we often bond on Absolutely. or battle exactly. against, right? Whether it was in the in the playground or in life, but to look at it from this sort of inequality, mm -hmm. perhaps in the business, mm -hmm. that was really early because we're just really starting to interrogate that now. So how did you how did you get there? Well, we were both told that we did not have enough to write about. So I mean, you ah, now I think you know we've both okay. been invited to speak at different schools where. Women are like, I'm doing my PhD dissertation mm -hmm. on black hair, and sure. they don't have to bat. We had to actually battle our professors to be able to do. We were both told, you're going to get an F. There's not a lot. Maybe you could do a four-page paper on this. We both really had to stand up and really just accept that we believe differently. And mm -hmm. even though you've told us you're setting yourselves up for literal failure in this mm -hmm. class, we're going to do it, and there's enough. And both of our professors told us, oh, you, you should turn this into a book. And Lori was invited to her professor's house after she handed in her paper, and she apologized and said, this is amazing, I didn't know about this, you need to turn this into a book. Which, you know, then maybe seven years later, we, we did that. We met each other. But, I, but we were, I mean, both of us kind of went out on a step, it was, it was a, you know, we went out on faith, mm -hmm. thinking, all right, we said, I know that there's something to say, but there weren't books. There weren't, and even when we finally met, we met at Vibe Magazine. We were both working as fact checkers, and our, oh, our boss oh, told us, do you know you both have this weird fascination with hair? Even then, when we decided that we were going to write a book, you know, combining mm -hmm. our two projects, we still had to, you know, fight people to say that this does ex that there, there's something important here to talk about. Right. But we really were kind of young journalists at the time, and we even were thinking, where are we going to find all of the information we need? And we had to go. There weren't books already written. We had to go back to original sources. We had to go to primary sources. We had to look at European explorer diary entries from the 15th century, where they wrote about what they saw on the heads of African people. Wow! Wait! Wait! Yeah. 
you guys at home, I know you might want to talk about because you're getting to something here. We want you to interact with us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all social media places. Our handles are on the screen because what Lori and Ayana are talking about are going to be are going to I'm sure get you talking. And me, I'm at Michaela Angela D. And Mad Free is Mad underscore Free underscore. And Ayana, just quickly, I'm at, at Ayana Bird, and I'm at Lori Tharps. Because this is a, this is a community conversation, yes. and I didn't know you all. I guess I was at we're we're Vibe we're alumni. All vibe. I, I was um, the first fashion director at Vibe, so all um, lives start at Vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But but it was but it was the dawn of this kind of um, journalism with this. We were starting to define our times, and mm -hmm. I think that's what we're getting to here, like, yeah. that the fact that you saw that something was important enough to, and this is why journalism and writing is so important, not just, you know, having this great big social media imprint, but putting it down for generations to come. So once you write a book, that means that it was important to, to, to organize and to chronicle, and so right. you're saying you had to go back, back. We had to go so far back. We went, you know, we... Again, had to go. We spent a lot of time at the Schomburg. We could have um, moved in as often as we were at the Schomburg. We were looking at old magazines. You know, we right. literally had to see what was society saying or producing when around black hair. Mm -hmm. And of course, we talked to professors, sure. and we also talked to hairstylists from you know who were working in the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. to hear from mm -hmm. their experiences and any other everyday person because anybody with black hair had a story to tell. Right. So we really went to the experts, meaning, you know, from the gamut, from right. politics, from business, from just everyday living, right. and put this story together for the first time ever. You know what was really powerful is, you know, w and we're going to get to why you did a revised version, because mm -hmm. there's an explosion of energy yes. around hair, particularly natural hair now, but it did not start in 2000. It started in the 1400s and, right. and I think what's so interesting and why your book is so important is that you because when you see the history of it and you understand in you know in different parts of Africa what using your hair meant in all these different ways to express it mm -hmm. um, you get to see what our trajectory is and what the energy is where the energy is coming from and also this huge community of young hungry men and women know that we come from something, right? Like there's a great big audience now that was so hungry for information and now you have it. So why did you do it again? We, so the book originally came out in 2001 and we had this vision that maybe 25, 30 years from now, we'll be able to maybe hopefully add one new chapter. And then the internet happened. I mean, that sounds so obvious now, right. but when we first did the book, email was barely a thing. Neither of us even had internet at home when we wrote the original book. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, you know, the mm -hmm. conversation I had with you, mm -hmm. we interviewed you for mm -hmm. the new chapters in the book, were really about the conversations that black women and these communities that exist online and that carry into real life and the way that our, we're not just talking about beauty, we're talking about identity and politics yeah. and self-confidence and racial, I'm mean, so much mm -hmm. around hair because we can get onto chat rooms, we can, well, chat rooms. I mean, so, think uh, anyone my that. <laughs> I'm dating myself. On Facebook, on blogs, on YouTube, Instagram, like, things, you know, are being created today that we're right going to use to, like, forward the hair conversation. And that was so, it just felt like if we yeah, had a exciting. book about the history of black hair, how could we not include the internet and that when yeah. so many women who did not think that they necessarily had anything to talk about or women you know mm -hmm. Lori grew up in Wisconsin and when she went natural she was alone yes like, so completely alone, alone. <laughs> well that you know equivalent today mm -hmm. can go online and not right. feel alone and not feel isolated and not feel like every conversation she's having mm -hmm. is someone saying why did you do that to your hair you're right. crazy you you need a perm, or oh, I can get you a perm. But wasn't that what you were always told? Right, like or a just, forgotten one. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I get and, one for you. Yeah, and, oh. and, and, but in even the product angle mm -hmm. of it, also the internet affected the ability sure. to sell products. Sure. Whereas you know those of us who lived in Brooklyn, you know, if you wanted to get products for natural hair, you had to go on the street to the guy selling the green grease in the on Fulton and Mall. The wax. Right. Yeah. And now. 
because of the internet, women and men, but mm -hmm. mostly women, could create products and distribute them in a way that they would have never had the possibility of before. So the internet yeah. affected the business, it affected the culture, mm -hmm. but also there was just, you know, we committed to chronicling the story of black hair in America, right. and that story did not stop in right. 2000. Things continued to happen, both good and bad, that we felt, again, if we're, we're still the only book that does this, we can't stop talking about it and so right. we wanted to make sure that the story continued and was as updated as possible and we literally were adding things to the manuscript until the day we handed it into our publisher because you can't live in this country and not realize that someone's got fired from mm -hmm. their job because of their hair or mm -hmm. somebody made you know um, like Gabrielle Douglas in the Olympics you know sure. that conversation or somebody started a new business or a business was sold mm -hmm. that really got people talking again and we, it has to be documented because it is that important. It, and you know I, I've, all, I've often have said that there are hair as a repository for our history, our yeah. hysteria, yes. our you know our glory and Absolutely. we've been silent for so long and that's why the, the internet and social media has opened this floodgate of all these voices coming in mm -hmm. and all this energy coming in and so it's going to it's going to keep coming and keep coming and keep listening. Um, but I think what's interesting too is that you were looking at the business end early, and you know we're a couple blocks from Target. I know mm -hmm. we were having this conversation before. We can go over to Target right now and get you know Carol's daughter hair rules, shave moisture, all these different kinds of products that were not there. That mm -hmm. you had to either, like you said, get it on the street right. or go to go to the hood hood, you right. know, and go and crawl through some aisle to <laughs> right. find pink lotion, <laughs> right. you know, and. Which so, didn't even work most of the time. No. You know, these products were, you'd be going to all who knows where, buying products that, again, didn't do what you wanted it to do also. But the also. people are demanding. I mean, this is what, this is what revolution is, right? Yeah. When, when people move things forward and the energy that so many women have had around ne wanting their stuff. Like, girl, you know, we want our stuff. We mm -hmm. want things that are going to yes. do, um, do well, smell good, yes. look cute. Yes. And, and be healthy for us right. and not full of things that we can't pronounce and hope and not looking at our hair as though every single black person has the exact kind of same kind of hair that mm -hmm. responds exactly the same way to products when you know white women have I mean really if we walked to that same target and looked mm -hmm. at what was available fine I mean adjectives I don't even know what they mean <laughs> for white hair but we were all expected right. to use the, the black, black hair the right. black the hair black. product I mean just look at Look at, uh, and you know, in any given day, our hair changes texture too, right? Mm -hmm, like this mm -hmm. is a conversation that we're going to have with um, another friend. We were um, talking about how we have to wake up every morning and have a new relationship. Yes. Like the That's weather, it. like it's raining out right. there, right? right? So we know that something new can happen on top of our head <laughs> right. just because of the weather. But what's what's interesting is that we have to have relationship now, right? I, I feel like so many, um, so much of our history has been to let someone do your hair, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whether it was your grandmother trying to control it into a bun. Or fix it. Or hair. fix it right. or mm -hmm. change it. Mm -hmm. And you didn't want to know about her. You know, you didn't want to touch it and know yeah. that on this day it can be a different. But now when you go on YouTube. Oh, wait a minute. You have to. <laughs> But you you have to tell us what your um, term is for my my the the black hair porn. Like I cannot. It's like you get addicted to these these um, YouTube videos. Yes. And to to defend my addiction, I have to say hair exactly porn. at you. It's hair porn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> say it what it is. You know. The thing is, like, exactly what you said, like, I, every day, am like, I didn't know my hair could do that, or, like, because it's humid, I didn't mm -hmm. know my hair would look like this, or, so, it's, it's an exploration yeah. of all this, that previously we were trying to straighten it or sub submit it or something, mm -hmm. and now we're celebrating it, so you do, you want to go online and see what yeah. products, what styles, what, you know, techniques you can use, and that is a complete, that to me is revolutionary. That is a new conversation. That is a whole new attitude that we as black women can have about our hair, and like mm -hmm. exactly what you said was so key, we never wanted to touch it. People right. didn't want to touch and feel it and luxuriate in our hair. We wanted mm -hmm. to get it straighter, That's you right. know? And then you put so much oil or whatever in it to keep it that way, you still didn't want to touch it. Right. Now, 
you know, the products, they smell good, like yes. you said. They make your hair feel good. Mm -hmm. You've got these styles that are fun and ex beautiful. And, it's and you know how to do them yourself. Okay. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. all. You know, when we first came out with the book, and we would say, oh, this history of black hair is a story of celebration and art, and people would look at us politely but think, what are you talking about? Every time I hear people <laughs> talking about black hair, it's, they're, painful. it's painful, it's sad, there's these stories, and we're like, that's a part of it, but also it's celebration. Well, now, if you really turn to a lot of these YouTube tutorials, mm -hmm. or if you look on the conversations people are having on blogs, mm -hmm. You know, we were right. It is a story of celebration mm -hmm. of people wanting to really explore the beauty of our hair and not, it, we weren't born feeling ashamed of our hair. And mm -hmm. now it's, I think it's, there's this whole other conversation coming in letting us know, don't bring the shame on, don't feed into these I ideas that mm -hmm. still exist in the world, right? Sure. Not like the rest of the world logged onto one website and it's like, yay, <laughs> black hair. I mean, there's still a fight sure. going on, but there's, the other side is really like, we've really been reinforced and being mm -hmm. able to say like, we're beautiful the way we are. We can celebrate it. We can change it. If I want to get a weave to, you know, I mean, that's right. not to even put down women no who are shade. not natural. I mean, that, right. that's, that's part of, you know, why I'm framing this as a happy hair conversation because mm -hmm. it's really about being, at the end of it all, it's about being happy. And happiness is a discovery, right? And so, yes. and then I think that's one of the things that's so exciting about seeing this community and going online and seeing women of all ages from 12 to 80 discovering what their hair can do right. and, yeah. and seeing them make all these shapes and these beautiful, like, I don't even know how they have the time. Like, yeah. I, like my freedom yeah. hair is about <laughs> as far as I can go mm -hmm. um, in terms of just time, but I see these beautiful up twists and, and um, combinations of mm -hmm. textures and combinations mm -hmm. of styles way more, and this is back to sort of the business end, way more than what I would see in like advertising. For instance, most advertisements around these products that are targeting us, because now they know we're real. Yes. This market is very real, it spends yes. billions of dollars, but generally you see textures that maybe are somewhere around Ayana and mine, like loose curls, like this mm -hmm. proximity to a European st um, standard, it, it's still close, like I can kind of understand ringlets, right? Right, right. right. Um, but when you go to these meetups, you see every single texture, like this idea of the breadth and the and the abundance of textures right. and what we can do with them. And any like I have your texture and your texture, and I like it when it's all of them together because right. it's very confusing. <laughs> um, but this, but I still think that there's um, there's still pushing mm -hmm. and and educating that we're doing yeah. with each other and I find that that very encouraging that women are sharing ideas independently right. they don't have to go through magazines anymore but I think that Madison Avenue needs to go the next step okay now you're not afraid of natural hair mm -hmm. there are all these different ranges of skin tones like, like Lupita mm -hmm. I think has come in and started a new conversation right yeah. her hair is not only tight, it's short, right? right? Exactly. So this idea that, I still think there's this idea that your hair has to move, you right, know, yeah, right, right. in order for it to, to be right. acceptable, but here she comes putting cuts in it, right. and Her, diamonds, right, and she's right. so dark. Headband, and, like these really feminine things yes. around hair that we've always defined. And a Caesar. Yes. Right, right. I, we've love always, it. Always, yeah. I think though that, um, I think that Madison Avenue is, Madison Avenue, Hollywood, those are not the innovators. Like yeah, and they're the creative, prepare for us, right? The creative, the creative energy in this country is never really coming from the creative mm -hmm. people. Meaning, you know, again, like Hollywood advertisers. Sure. They are so standard. So whether it's white or black, you know, mm -hmm. beauty is long hair, blonde, blue eyes, and if it's a black person, it's the one who looks as close to that blonde mm -hmm. hair, long. I mean, yeah. yeah, long blonde hair, like Beyonce, right? right. She is a product of kind of like mainstream, which is why everybody loves her. But she also her. interrupts that too with her hips. She, she does. She interrupts but that her, often. Her, her th this, again, this idea of your proximity to European standards right. is what makes people feel comfortable. And I know that very well. Like right. I, I'm so clear right. that if I knocked on someone's door, I probably wouldn't get my face blown off. Right, right, right. Because right, right. of my proximity to a Europe, to an understanding that feels right, safe. Right. So the further away that you get from that understanding that has been promoted so well for so right, long, right, <laughs> like right. they've had a really good run. Right. Um, then I think the further away that you get from that, the more other you become. Right. But this is a new kind of other, right? What I was gonna say is just that I think that what's so wonderful is about the explosion or the the demo democratization, democratization of the internet is that yes. we can see other 
options. Mm -hmm. Like we don't, we're not dependent on what Hollywood or Madison Avenue mm -hmm. says because if we still look there, then we haven't really moved very far because we haven't really seen a wide range of beauty differences. But if you go online, if right. you go to Pinterest, like you can, you can just gorge yourself you can. on right. options. Not mm -hmm. to mention, if you go out on the street in a lot of cities, you cannot Especially help but be amazed Brooklyn. at what. Yes, yes. I we, mean, we're so, here at the. This is the epicenter this is the, of, of the center. Yes. Like you know, uh, Carol's daughter started around the corner, right? right. Which was this right. beginning of. It's in a package. Right. It's, it's an aesthetic that we understand. Yeah. Or you would go to Dance Africa and right. see. Right. You, you, oh, yes. my God. Right? Like You'd be you so would, inspired. Yes, yes. And I just think that that is spreading. Like, yes. even, even if you still live in Wisconsin. Well, if you think I? of Philly, you know, we started, we both lived in Brooklyn mm -hmm. when we first wrote the book. I'm from Philadelphia. Lori moved there um, years ago, many years ago. <laughs> after the book. But I used to come from Brooklyn and assuming certain things were normal as far as hair because I saw right. this, like, range of textures every time mm -hmm. I stepped outside my door in bed -Stuy. And then I'd go to Philly and I was being stared at like I was, where did you come? Oh, this is, yeah, she lives in Brooklyn. And everybody's like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, now it's not like that. I mean, no one, I don't get noticed. It's, and if it is, it's women who are like, oh, how do you do your hair? I like your hair, what do you use in your hair? I just went natural. Like, it's not, this conversation is definitely spread that I think yeah. there's far fewer pockets in this country where natural hair is not seen or where it's just not, thought of as normal. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really, I think, the point is that it seems so crazy that we have to, like, fight for what grows out of our head to be seen as normal, mm -hmm. but it is more normal in a lot of places now. Yeah. And, you know, it started online, but the younger people are logging on and seeing something growing up. Imagine if we'd mm -hmm. grown up and this was just what we saw Well, my every daughter's day. 23, and the reason I have freedom hair is because I got pregnant. There was no FDA regulations around relaxers. Zero. There still aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I never wore my hair straight, but I would run, we texturized it. It was mm -hmm. like at the end of um, Jerry Curls. <laughs> so I texturized. <laughs> but no doctor could tell me whether it would cause any neurological damage. So I stopped putting chemicals in my hair because they couldn't prove it, right? Mm -hmm. And I realized that I hadn't seen my own texture mm -hmm. in a long time. Mm -hmm. And the response that I got, to, this is 23 years ago. This is before Maxwell. This is before Macy Gray. Right. You know, I'm walking down the street with this hair. And the reaction w was so interesting. Mm -hmm. From men, most men, lo like, brothers were like, oh, I love your hair. Because so, they could touch it. This mm -hmm. idea of not being able to touch right. it. Right. Um, women were... It was mixed, mm -hmm. you know, it was mm -hmm. kind of, oh my God, what'd she do? You know? <laughs> um, I literally was told in a black institution that I was a waste of yellow. Oh, oh but not even yellow, yellow. I was a waste of yellow. Oh my um, gosh. So we're, we were, there was a lot of negotiation going on around 23 years ago because of the history. And I think that's what's so important. When you know your history, you also have compassion right. around people who right. don't get it. Right. Whether it's that crazy person that wants to touch it on the street, right. or your grandmother. My, right. my my hair used to make my grandmother really upset. I mm. I actually got to the point where Christmas, like I would just get the gel and pull it back and just let's have dinner. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but what's important about wow. writing down the history? We're not, you know, we're not starting with the internet. Right. We're starting with the transatlantic. Trade, exactly. Right, and then we can see when we when you know where you've been, you can see where you you are, and and celebrate it. Like yes. this is and a feel real pride in it. and feel exactly. pride yes. and happiness because I do feel like there are parts of this conversation of this community where we're stuck. It's like the nappy part in the back, right? Where you're stuck. <laughs> Okay. You come on, it's you know true. what I mean? Like, it's totally true. It's the part that you <laughs> want to hide or you brush over. And again, why I'm so thankful for you for your scholarship and for your curiosity is because we can we can see that everyone is on a journey, right? And there may be some people on the other side, um, who, who aren't on the other side, I'm sorry, um, that are on their way. Because I, I know that some people are like, it's just hair. Well, like, can I have. just be a girl? Can I? That's what and, we said. Yeah. We always, like every time people ask us, you know, what what's your hope or what do you want? We've always said, we wrote this book to educate people because mm -hmm. A lot of people assumed that we wrote the book because we wanted everyone to go natural, throw away the perm, and, you know, celebrate their natural hair. That has never been our agenda. Our agenda has always been, once you know the story mm -hmm. of your own hair, once you understand where it's been and how significant it has been in the black experience in America, whether you're black or white, you can't 
you can't make a frivolous decision and hopefully you can't feel ashamed anymore mm -hmm. about your hair once you realize how important, significant, strong and mm -hmm. empowering our hair has been in mm -hmm. defining our place here in this country. So like again, whether your hair is straight or kinky or curly or, or in a long, bun, long, or, short, like, mm -hmm. it's it's knowing it. It's like giving somebody a gift of their own identity and understanding, like, this is, this is part of who you are. And I think I, I liken it to a child who's adopted, perhaps, and doesn't know where they come from, you know? They don't have mm -hmm. a story. Mm -hmm. And that feels like there's always something missing and maybe they feel sh slightly shameful or something about it and then you give them their birth story or they meet their birth parents and suddenly they feel whole. Oh, it's the Lori, same that's thing. Oh, beautiful. No, oh, I'm you. sorry, that's not the clip. No, no. <laughs> but it's the same thing. It's like, it's, here's your story. Here's your you don't story. need to, because it's, it's so much, so much of what we've, we were, we always say like, why do I feel like this because mm. of my hair? Why do I have to negotiate or feel ashamed or like cover it up or fix it? It's because we don't know, we don't understand, you know, what was done to us, like mentally with mm -hmm. telling us that our hair was, you know, like an animal. Mm -hmm. We don't understand that we were denied and access and entry all these things happen and yet our hair it didn't fall out it didn't disappear right. it has rotate yeah but I mean, like, <laughs> let's be clear <laughs> but like it, it's still it's so unique but it comes it's back. still unique it yes. is still what it was 500 years mm -hmm. ago do you know what i mean like it is still not white hair it did right. not assimilate our hair is still that powerful force that has the unique qualities that mm -hmm. only right. black hair does and you know what again i'm what I love, too, is the sisterhood that you all have created, too, in doing this work together and presenting this work together because it also, our hair has been a battleground mm -hmm. for it, us as black exactly. women, as sisters. Like, exactly. the thing that makes us so beautiful, <clears throat> meaning our differences, whether it's skin tone or hair, mm -hmm. like, this is what is so exciting about being black is that we have this plethora of beauty. Yes. But it's been given to us as weapons, right? Mm -hmm. And so... And always on a hierarchy. This yes. Is better than this. And better, good, bad. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you all did this together also creates this sisterhood of, um, and the optics of seeing, look, we can even be, we can be together on the thing that often rips us apart because of attention or something that someone mm -hmm. gets and grading each other on right. something that we didn't have any power over. Like, right. you didn't choose the texture of it. I mean, we can change it. We can do double twist. Right, right. right. <laughs> we can do, we can, you know. But this idea of, of being sisters around our hair is also revolution because we have to get happy first right. and then we can be outwardly happy to other people right. you know right. and happily educate the others about Absolutely. who we are but the fact that you've given this to two and four sisters first mm -hmm. like here's your story right. is really powerful and that is that's the way that we heal right and that yes, exactly. that you all have come together your friends your sisters you're different, mm -hmm. you know, you have different takes, but we can be united in this big, happy, nappy world that we're in versus fighting it. Because I think it's been such a fight. And it we're is. just like, oh. Well, that's what, you know, talk about the, um, you know more about the grading and hair typing and how that's kind of been just another version of that. Well, you know, we, <coughs> I heard I heard there were these different types. You know, I think oh, a lot the of people. The three, the four, the, three the, G, a, the, the five. four, yeah, yeah. F. I mean, I don't think that's one. <laughs> but I didn't really know about it until last summer. I started researching it for the new chapters about, um, for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, these different ways that a lot of natural hair sites categorize hair according to curl texture. And I thought, oh, why are they? You know, I, it was like this foreign thing. And then as I started researching it, I thought, well, this is really new, fancy scientific sounding ways to really still talk about grades of hair, right? Like that was a term used in my house. Like what grade of hair does she have as opposed to good or bad hair in my house when I was growing up? And I thought, okay, in some ways these divisions are good. If you're just looking at like photo archives and you wanna see, oh, this is my hair texture, these are pictures of it. Here's an easy way to look at it. But other ways it was like fear that this was really what was dividing women. Like you can still on a natural hair site feel like there's a texture that's better and texture that's worse. Mm -hmm. And we started talking to a lot of women because we wanted to find out, you know, is what have, look, it looks like online, is this what's happening in real life? And, so we, we yeah. still have work to do. 
Yeah, but we're on our way. <laughs> we're we're going to take a quick break now, and up next, we're going to be joined by global diversity expert and lupus advocate Michelle Gasson Williams to talk about our hair and our health and corporate hierarchy. So stay right there. What this whole mad free thing is, we call it liberating conversations. I'm Michaela Angela Davis, and I'm an image activist. I thought it was important to kind of create a project that could start a movement because I would have these conversations where I'd go on TV and then it would be over. It's a conversation project that will exist on multi-platforms. It's about expanding these narrow narratives and starting repetitious, continuous, aggressive, communal conversations about who we say we are with revolutionary women whose work and lives serve to liberate us. That's the thing, everybody wants to talk to and about black girls. I want him to engage with us. When I speak up in situations, I realize how gangster mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> her whole everything, her whole essence changed. She feels more comfortable with herself. Our hair can change form, change shape, and, and adapt to Whatever. It's not really that surprising to hear that a black woman in an environment like Princeton would feel a sense of double consciousness. The older black women mentoring younger black women, I think that's a lovely relationship. What makes me powerful is how you see me. I am me. The end result, I hope, is happiness and a sense of psychological and emotional freedom. I will sit at the feet of Angela Davis. I will sit at the feet of Sonia Sanchez. I will sit at their feet and learn and listen, but I also I have, to, I have to know how we do it in this generation. If you're just joining us, we've had a friend enter the table, and it was on the break. Um, Ayana was just saying that she used to assist a friend of mine, Harriet Cole, and she would see us with our natural hair and think to herself, oh my gosh, I can have a successful career <laughs> and, and have I natural had hair. Before that, I was 22. It's hard, to, it's hard to be what you can't see. And Michelle, yeah. you are, um, you're an executive executive. <laughs> and, and so I'm sure that the optics of who you are are rare in your space. I know that um, for those of you who don't know you, but I know that you told me that you're the only African-American managing Director. Per, director in your universe and um, share with us just your first story of you entering a boardroom with your new hair and, and, and a little bit of that journey. <laughs> okay. Um, I entered the boardroom for the first time with natural hair last summer. Um, and the reason why I chose to go natural was for health reasons. I mm -hmm. suffer from lupus and part of the symptoms of lupus is hair loss. And I said, if I'm going to turn this around, if I'm going to get better, mm -hmm. um, I need to not only focus on wellness from the inside out, but also from my hair, from that perspective. So I decided to go completely natural last summer, uh, and I walked into the boardroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we were having an offsite meeting that day, right. so I had 20 colleagues from all over the world sitting around a table, and they saw me and said, wow, oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> and I said, yes, it does. So it conjured up an interesting conversation mm -hmm. because it's a global audience. They don't know the first thing about the whole natural hair movement. Right. They don't understand the history behind it. Mm -hmm. So it conjured up a 20 minute conversation at this particular meeting, which I welcomed. Because right. for me, to demystify, to debunk all the questions, mm -hmm. let's talk about it. So it was me meeting them where they were. Right. And it was really promoting education and awareness about the whys and wherefores in terms of why I made this, this, this decision. Mm -hmm. I do work for a Wall Street firm, so it doesn't get much stodgier than that in terms mm -hmm. of how I show right. up. No one would ever so, know, because yeah. you're looking really flawed. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think anybody on Wall Street <laughs> you. looking you. like you, but yes. Yeah, so it, 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 I, I think it was a, a real um, transformation mm -hmm. for black women, particularly those who work on Wall Street. There are several of us who do have natural hair, different degrees of natural hair and what right. that uh, is, it looks like. But for me, within my firm, uh, as a managing director, I'm the only managing mm -hmm. director African-American female that has natural hair, so to speak. And I feel freer, I am healthier as a result of my decision, and I have no plans to turn back at this point. And so. I bet you there's some young woman looking at you too, seeing that. <laughs> but, and I wanna kinda come back to your, um, your hair 
and also living with lupus. And, and why that's significant also right now is a really young star in the natural hair movement, Dominique Banks, yeah. um, passed away recently of lupus. And it made this community bring this to, to, to the table, to talk about um, lupus and hair and hair loss. Yeah. And as a, you were a lupus ad advocate before we lost Dominique, but also um, being a, an example and a mentor in this moment and helping young black women understand what is lupus, what to look for, and also how this connects to your health. So I really like to kind of get it, get us back there. And sure. So uh, if I could define lupus um, for a moment, it's a chronic, highly complex autoimmune illness mm -hmm. that, simplistically stated, it's where your body attacks itself, mm -hmm. its major organs and its tissues. It causes your, your body to go into what we call flares, mm -hmm. and that's flares of inflammation, um, it's the flu that won't go away, so you have these unexplained fevers, you have swelling, and it, it's, it's horrible. So with me, specifically, uh, my flares will send me to the emergency room. I have fevers that spike up to 103, 104, I'm swollen, I have pain, chronic pain uh, that only things like morphine can fix. Wow. So for me, it's, it's quite serious. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I have lung and kidney involvement also, mm -hmm. it's uh, attacked my neurological system. So it's been quite a devastating few years. I was diagnosed in 2005. Um, so it, it is quite serious. It took three years mm -hmm. to get diagnosed. Once the symptoms started presenting themselves, it started off with a mild flu here and there. It would come and go. My ankles would swell here and there. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I am over 40, so maybe that's why my ankles are swelling. And I'm on a plane every other day. Right. Maybe that's why my ankles are swelling. Right. But um, it just got progressively worse. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to the doctor, and they would say, oh, well, it's you, you, you're from New Jersey. Maybe you have. Uh, uh, what are they called? Lyme's disease. Right. Oh, okay. And I said, Lyme's? Oh, okay. I live in Deer County, so to speak, and there are deer roaming around my backyard, so that was not far-fetched. So I said, okay, so I have Lyme's disease, so how do we treat that? So initially, I was treated for that. That didn't go away, so over time, I had to continuously see, I saw probably three or four rheumatologists. You know what, before. Michelle, let me hold, you, yeah. hold on for a second, because I know that people are going to want to join this conversation, because it's a, it's a new critical point that we're at. Um, so if you can tweet along, share your comments on Facebook, and also address some questions, right, um, on all our pl um, social media platforms. Michelle, what's your Twitter? Because I, I'm sure this is, people will have questions now about lupus. And, Absolutely. And we'd love to have you share. It's M Gadsden, G-A-D-S-D-E-N, <laughs> William, no S at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, M Gadsden William on, yeah. um, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So. You, you've hit to something, and I think that happens also a lot with black women, because mm -hmm. I know this, I have not not nearly the same kind of autoimmune um, um, disease, but this idea that, oh, you're over 40, you're stressed out, like our, our symptoms get dismissed, and, like mm -hmm. you're having some kind of hysteric moment, yeah. mm -hmm. and you, but something in you told you to keep going. How did, yeah. t talk about that. Well, it took a while for me to keep going, because I think culturally, we just don't get to the doctor as we should. Mm -hmm. And Say I that. probably should have gone <laughs> yeah. um, probably two years uh, into the whole symptom manifestation process. Mm -hmm. We just keep working. We right? just keep working. And I, you know, we're almost taught, and my parents are from the South. So culturally, for me, you just keep going. A headache, That's you right. take an aspirin, you just keep moving. Mm -hmm. And that was my, my, my remedy for mm -hmm. myself. It just got progressively worse where memory loss was happening. I would stand mm -hmm. up in front of executives and just common words would, would, wouldn't even come to me. I would look at your face and not right. even remember your name. So it was starting to get progressively worse, mm -hmm. incredibly chronic. By the time I saw a doctor uh, in Switzerland, which is where I was living at the time, he said, if we don't get this under control, you will not live to see your 50th birthday. Wow. And I just had a birthday two weeks ago. I'm not going to tell what Yay. my name is on television, but well, I uh, guess yeah. I'm 50. I got, I, got very, <laughs> I got very comfy with how uncomfortable that was a while ago. But, you know, I'm a little amazed that you, I mean, Michelle has a really big job, that you were able to do that while managing a disease that was doing these things. To, I mean, how did, how did you do that? Well, I've had help. 
Uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to be right. honest with you. Okay. Well, the first thing is, when you receive a chronic diagnosis like that, I, I was a well woman before all this happened, and once I understood exactly what this disease was, and mm -hmm. I went on WebMD and I did all of my research, mm -hmm. I joined a board, the SLE Lupus Foundation Board of New York City. Okay. Because one of the things for me that I needed to understand was, so what is this illness? Mm -hmm. How do we, there is no cure, so how do I live with the new normal of mm -hmm. being a lupus sufferer? Mm -hmm. um, I sought out the help of a wellness coach in Los Angeles, AJ Johnson. Oh, great. Uh, so AJ. she's mm -hmm. been amazing mm -hmm. in helping me to create just a, a new normal for me in terms of diet, managing my stress, mm -hmm. managing my crazy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I, I have a global job, so I'm on a plane a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and just keeping me on the straight and narrow because I, I, like most overachievers, I was all over the place and I was not managing my home life properly, my mm -hmm. work life, and it was just stress. My life was just one ball of stress. And how did this ball of stress affect your hair? Um, hair loss. I mean, hair I was loss. thinning. Uh, mm -hmm. I would comb my hair. I was almost like a chemo patient, so I would comb my hair, mm -hmm. and there was, you know, a lot of hair in the comb. It was just really, it was sad for me. That was oh, a really sure. dark time for me because mm -hmm. I think I, I, I almost was mourning my wellness for a while, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. why I sought the help of a life coach because I did go through this. Why me? You know, mm -hmm. why now? Mm -hmm. I was just promoted to the job of my dreams. Mm -hmm. I had just moved to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, my husband retired from his job. He moved to Switzerland. And all of a sudden, you're diagnosed with this illness with no cure, and you have to figure out, so now what do I do with this information? Mm -hmm. And how am I going to live the rest of my life? So I just made some, some conscious choices mm -hmm. uh, for myself. Uh, I will probably not retire from working at 65. I will probably retire maybe in my mid 50s i'm putting that on record here today. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, yeah. yeah so i i just think that for me um i'm not like everyone else and i i understand that mm -hmm. fully there are things that i'm doing for me now there are conscious decisions and choices mm -hmm. that i'm making for myself in terms of how i live my life um, i have no desire to be anyone's ceo or anything like that i'm in the job of my dreams mm -hmm. What's important for me and what I'm incredibly gratified with every single day is to help the next generation of leaders succeed. Mm -hmm. So if, if I can do that, then mm -hmm. I'm doing my job. I also sit on six boards, non-for-profits, oh in New York City and outside of New York City. So I'm doing the things that I want to do. So with help, I've been able to live and lead a normal lifestyle. What would you want this community that's, that's watching, these mostly probably young women of color, young women of color that are having their, you know, hair explorations. What, what would you want to say to them? I, I would say, you know, career is everything. Um, I was there once and I, I, I put my career ahead of a lot of things. And I think the biggest life lesson I've learned mm -hmm. is I did not pay attention to the signs. Uh, mm -hmm. my symptoms and I ignored them for two probably close to three years mm -hmm. pay attention to your body mm -hmm. go to get your annual checkups and visits go to the doctor even if it is a headache these uh, I, I thought that I had a flu I really did and Lyme's disease I said okay I'll take some antibiotics and mm -hmm. everything will go away and I'll be better mm -hmm. well that didn't happen for me so one of my biggest regrets is not paying attention to my body, not being my own advocate and champion, I would go to the doctor mm -hmm. without as much as a pen and a piece of paper. Yeah. And we don't do that for ourselves. Yeah. I, I didn't bring a girlfriend or my mother or some, you know, f a, a person to come in with me to ask the questions mm -hmm. that I just could not ask uh, for myself mm -hmm. because I was so into, okay, I have this illness, now what do I do? And I'm into that woe is me mode. I needed someone to go with me and to do that. And so my husband filled that void for me. So. I, I think that there are several lessons for me mm -hmm. that if I could do things differently, I would stay on top of my health regimen, mm -hmm. get to the doctor often, um, ask questions for yourself, be your own champion, be your own health advocate. If you need the help of uh, a life coach, do that for yourself. Mm -hmm. These individuals do help. And also put your health first before career. Right. A career is nice, but if you don't have your health, what do you have? So did you find that so. going natural helped you be healthier? Like we were, we were talking on the phone and you were like, you know, I realized all this manipulating and things I would never do to my body. Mm. Like we don't flat iron our body every day. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that you were doing to your hair. Yeah. Um, you realized that you were manipulating your hair in a way that you would never do to other things. Like has that helped you? You know, putting down the white cream and yeah. these other, has it helped you? 
It has. Um, the piece of the puzzle that was missing for me in terms of my wellness regimen was my hair. So I was doing all the right things in terms of diet and exercise and all of that, but I was still flat ironing. I was still <laughs> exposing my hair to the elements and all the things that we do to our hair, which was keeps it not as healthy as it could be. Um, so last summer I had my 13th surgery. Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, that one was not lupus related, but mm -hmm. over years I've had several medical conditions, but mm -hmm. th uh, last August I had another surgical procedure, and before I went back to work, I said, if I'm going to be in remission with lupus, if I'm going to be a well woman, I need to take care of not just the body, mm -hmm. I need to take care of my hair as well, and cut out all the flat ironing and all the things that mm -hmm. will transition me to yeah. look the part in a corporate setting, because of course that's top of mind for me. I'm in, in a banking environment, I wear the uniform, and part of the uniform is the hair, right. and I wasn't taking care of my hair. so. No more white cream, no more <laughs> none of that. Um, I've been, actually I've been natural for over 10 years when I moved to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a perm since way back and when so I was And so why Switzerland? Um, Meaning I, like, I know I went natural because I knew that the government didn't know what was right. going in my hair. Right. In Switzerland, was there anybody there with ovens? <laughs> <laughs> you know what well, well, that was also the other reason for me mm -hmm. to go natural was there was no one who looked like any of us sitting at this table who could manage, who could style textured hair. Right. Women of color. Mm -hmm. There was no one who looked like me anywhere. The closest thing was we had a very large Dominican community and so I went to the Dominican hairstylist. But just like we do in Brooklyn. Just like we do in Brooklyn. <laughs> and so I, um, I had a lot of heat damage because there's a lot of blow drying and all of that. So they go hard. They, yeah, yeah. So I, it, it wasn't healthy at mm -hmm. all. So once I moved back to the States a year or so ago, um, I decided no more blow drying, no more flat ironing, none of it. So, and then once I got sick last summer and I had the surgery, I really said, None of it. It's just mm -hmm. not not going to be part of my daily regimen anymore. Iona and Lori, did, did, the health piece in natural hair and the governmental kind of um, regulation was that is that anything that you were interested in in finding out like our relationship to what we do with our hair and our health and also politics? Well, mm. <clears throat> excuse me. We were just talking about how um, I mean. The, the desire to straighten our hair started, you know, in slavery. It, it, the straightening our hair by any means necessary was not about getting cute. It was about looking more like Europeans so that you could have a better life, literally. So it's the same and as the so, boardroom, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's right. not, it was like this, I mean, peop, our okay. ancestors were doing, okay. I mean, creative and ingenious, but extremely dangerous things to lighten their, I mean, they would eat arsenic, you know, they would do all kinds of things to lighten their skin and straighten the hair that were, I mean, you, you poison yourselves, you know, in any number of ways. So that has been part of this process because I mean it's basically we're not supposed to be straightening our hair with chemicals I mean it's just not meant to be done and you're going against nature if you will mm -hmm. so we did you know we didn't discuss it specifically as a health issue per se but in our research and talking about different um, products there was um, you know the time when um, the government demanded to put labeling on certain products and you know mark them as dangerous or not mm -hmm. actually was more of an issue of uh, it, it hurt a black-owned company and not an, a white-owned company because the black-owned company was made to put the label on their product and the Say white it may owned be company. Harmful. Yeah. Ah. But the white-owned company didn't have to. So that, I mean, it was a political move, and it was right. it allowed one company to, um, you know, gain a better uh, foothold in the industry. But um, that is the, I mean, that's kind of like the Kool-Aid that we, you know, that we believe that the danger, you know, beauty, mm. beauty hurts, right. you know, the sores, the all of the things mm -hmm. that you, I mean, it would take kind of a, like, how could you not know that this product you're putting on your hair was possibly dangerous when you could bleed or it would burn your, like, burning yeah. scalp, not good, mm -hmm. you know? Like, More importantly, <laughs> why are there not studies, right? Like, you researched that. You were a journalist. You had the skills to, like, really do research when you were pregnant mm -hmm. to see what relaxers could do. and. Right. If you cannot get a definitive answer, and I think the bigger question is why? Why can we not mm -hmm. find out something so simple? I, you know, I 
never had a child, I can list 20 things that I know pregnant women are not supposed to do because it's just out there as common right. knowledge. But the thing that over 70% of black women in this country do, we do not have the common knowledge of if you can do it when you're pregnant. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's intentional. It's not just like no one thought that would be a good study. So I'm right. probably studied like what this pen means to our health, mm -hmm. but not relaxers. So I, I, I feel maybe another book. <laughs> um, we have, we have a, a, a natural hair activist in our intimate studio audience. Do you like to ask a question? I would. Yeah, go, right there. My <clears throat> name is Rodimus Julian. Thank you for having me. Um, this is more of a history question. What is the difference with the natural hair movement of the late uh, 60s and 70s versus today? And what happened to the momentum of that movement? That's a great question. Um, basically, the, I think the biggest difference, um, the early, the 60s political movement that went, you know, was part of the civil rights movement was really, it was a political movement, mm -hmm. whereas the natural hair movement in the 21st century is a beauty movement. Social it's a movement. beauty mm -hmm. revolution. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about before, um, in the 60s, it really was our, it was a way to say to white America, we're not going to assimilate. We deserve equal treatment mm -hmm. in our, this is who we are, and we don't need to hide ourselves anymore. Whereas today's natural mm -hmm. hair movement, it's about celebrating our beauty. It's about having fun. It's like finding the fun and celebration in a, our hair. Was, there was something very, very powerful, though, in the statement, black is beautiful. It was really putting the political and the beauty, because Beauty in this country is very political, right? right? And so I feel like there was something really encouraged, like we needed to hear that then. We needed yes. to hear Black is Beautiful as a mantra so we could get up and right. get out. The, but the feeling now is what? Well, so I, I, I was just, I'll finish real quick, but I, I think mm -hmm. that the, even though the mantra was Black is Beautiful, I think the, the big movement was more adopting that because it was powerful. It mm -hmm. was a physical manifestation of we are not, like I wanna join this movement mm -hmm. and if I can just free my hair up, I am a visual representation right. of the okay. movement. Gotcha. Whereas today, you know, you could ask somebody whose hair is in a beautiful afro what mm -hmm. she stands for and it's like, oh, I saw this on YouTube and it looks right. cute. Mm -hmm. Like right. it's, there's nothing political there's no about it. Right. But it's political in that black women can now find beauty like our hair is devoid of meaning is political because mm -hmm. it's beauty. We have never been allowed mm -hmm. to be can engaged right. in a beauty and it's, conversation. And it's men and women. I mean, we heard what Absolutely. happened on the campus at in uh, Hampton, where the brothers that were in law school were business told school. business school yeah. were told not to wear locks. Not to, so there's there's the politics of the hair politics are still being acted out in other people's imagination. Right. You know, you can find people who are like really down with the struggle that have a straight bob, of and course. then people who hair, whose hair looks like me and just like, you know, have no political leanings. You can't, you can't um, determine someone's political leanings based right. on their hair right. now, where right. before it really did represent, right. you know, this resistance. Right. Exactly. Right? exactly. And so, I think yeah. another difference to answer your question is that, um, you know, the beauty industry has really figured out how to co-opt this movement a lot quicker. They suffered in ah, the 60s, uh -huh. and they had to play a lot of catch-up. So even if you looked at advertising in the 60s and early 70s around black hair care products, you can tell when Madison Avenue got it together, like, this is how we're going to make some money, this is how we're going to get in on all this conversation. And, you know, they weren't absorbing the politics of it. They really just, like, how can we make money? You started to see ads in the early 70s where, relaxer ads had like kente cloth backgrounds, like things that I can describe <laughs> right. and sound like right. I'm making something up for like a TV satire, but we looked for well, you know, ads. Speaking of television, you know Soul Train was completely underwritten by Afrosheen Johnson. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was literally a show designed to sell hair products, which was mm -hmm. genius. I, right. I, I would love to do that right now, that right. same model. Right. Um, because And they did these interstitials and they showed you how to use Afrosheen. Mm -hmm. They had commercials with, you know, Frederick Douglass taught a boy how to pick out his <laughs> Afro in college. I remember that. Don't you remember that commercial? I love Soul Train. I forgot about that. I love Soul Train. Yeah, there was a commercial where there was a boy in a college dorm about to go outside, his afro was lopsided, Frederick Douglass came out of the past, <laughs> right? And was like, you know, you can't go out with your hair like that. You know, right. so it was like everything it was history, it was products, it was pride. 
you know, but it, they figured it, Don Cornelius and, and John Spade figured it. You know, I mean, yes. they really gave a lot of money back into communities that once a lot of... Yes, yeah. they, they funded a lot of scholarships and a lot of community programs, and okay. which was amazing, which does not happen. You know, once those companies were bought out by multinational, multinational um, white-owned companies, the scholarships, the community building... Frederick Douglass, like those are just like up, they they disappeared because it was not you could just give lip service to this idea. No one really saw the reasons why. Like we laugh at, I totally forgot about I mean, that it's commercial. A big but um, but to what I was saying, like I think today it was these corporations like, oh, we're not losing out on this money, and if we can control this conversation right away and you know, sort of take the bite out of the politics side of it and really make it about a beauty conversation. There is power in feeling beautiful in this country, this world that has never really supported black beauty. Well, we're owning this conversation yes. now, right? This, and and we're, we have to come to the end of this one, mm -hmm. but it's going to keep going, right? It's going to go on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Yes. And I'm just so glad that you all came and that we were oh, able yes. to have this moment and... Um, Keep it going, and like I said, I think we just came up with a new book today, <laughs> right? <laughs> Around the politics, the health, and the government. There's still a lot of there's still a lot of work to do. So um, thank you all for joining us, and keep the conversation going, and uh, stay happy. I'm Michaela Angela Davis, and I'm an image activist. I want to let you know about a new show coming this summer to Brooklyn Independent Media, a new channel by, for, and about Brooklyn. Each week, the Brooklyn Supernaturals will look at issues affecting women of color through the lens of natural hair. Learn more at brickartsmedia.org or at their Facebook page at Supernaturals BK.